Hi guys, thanks for joining again. Dealing with Dragons, Chapter 3. In which Simmerine meets a wizard and has doubts about a wizard. Therindil left, but he came back again the next day, and the day after that. It got so it got so that Simmerine could not even step outside the cave without running into him. She might have been flattered if it hadn't been so obvious that Therindil was only worried about how foolish he'd look if he went home without fighting the dragon. On his fifth visit, Simmerine was very sharp with him, and when he had not turned by mid-afternoon of the next day, she began to hope that he had finally left for good. Simmerine was in the kitchen taking the pits out of cherries when she heard someone knocking at the mouth of the cave. Sorry, little dog. <clears throat> Go away, she shouted in complete exasperation. I've told you and told you I don't want to be rescued and I'm not going to argue with you any more. I didn't come here to argue, said a no-nonsense female voice from outside. I came to meet the person who keeps borrowing my crepe pan. It's not something that's normally much called for. Oh dear, said Simmerine. She wiped her hands hastily on a corner of her apron and hurried out to greet her visitor. I'm sorry, she said, coming around the gray rock at the cave mouth, but I've been having a problem with knights lately and I thought... She stopped short as she got a good look at her collar for the first time. The woman standing outside the cave was considerably shorter than Simmerine. Her ginger hair was piled in waves on top of her head. She had on a loose black robe with long sleeves, which she wore unbelted. A small pair of glasses with rectangular lenses sat firmly on her nose, and she carried an extremely twiggy broom in her left hand. Despite her unusual appearance, she projected an air of great self-assurance. I quite understand, she said, studying Simmerine shrewdly. You must be Kazal's new princess. Yes, I'm Simmerine, and you are? Morwen, the black-robed woman, ah, said the black-robed woman, leaning the broom against the rock. Kazal and I have been friends for a long time, ever since I moved to the Enchanted Forest, so I thought I'd come and have a look at her new princess. You're the person Kazal's been borrowing dishes from, aren't you? Simmerine said and blinked. But then you must be a witch, Morwen finished. I don't see why you find it surprising. It's not exactly unusual profession in these parts. It's just that I haven't met one before, Simmerine said, not mentioning the fact that in Linderwall, witches were considered dangerous and probably evil, and were therefore best avoided, if at all possible. But then, people in Linderwall didn't much like dragons either. Won't you come in and have some tea? I certainly will, said the witch, and she did. She prowled around like a nervous cat while Simmerine put the kettle on the stove and got out the tea things. Well, Maureen said approvingly as Simmerine filled the teapot, you're the first princess I've ever met who has the sense to keep up with the kitchen. Simmerine decided that she liked Morwen's down-to-earth manner. She soon found herself telling Morwen everything, from the fencing and philosophy and Latin lessons to the seemingly endless stream of nights. The story lasted through two cups of tea and finished with Therindil's stubborn insistence on rescuing her. That is absurd, Morwen said decidedly when Simmerine finished. If this continues, you'll never get anything done. I know, Simmerine said. I keep telling them I don't want to be rescued, but they're all so honorable that none of them will tell anyone when they go back because they think it would be gossiping. More likely they don't want to look foolish. Maybe, but even if they did tell people, I'm not sure anyone would believe it. I have a hard enough time convincing the knights when they show up in person. It's just as well that your visitors have been honorable, Morwen said, looking thoughtful. Linderwall's a prosperous kingdom. Sooner or later, the chance of getting hold of half of it is going to tempt someone to try rescuing you, whether you want to be rescued or not. 
That hadn't occurred to me, Cimmerian said with a worried frown. What can I do about it? I'm not sure, Morin replied. The situation's not at all usual, you know. I've never heard of a princess volunteering for a dragon before. What rather surprises me, which rather surprises me, now that I think about it, a dragon's princess is practically guaranteed a good marriage, so you'd think princesses from the smaller kingdoms would be clamoring for the job. They're probably worried about being eaten, Cimmerian said. Do you think it would help if I sent my parents a letter? Probably not, Morwen said after a moment's consideration. But it can't hurt to try. I'll check my spell books when I get home. It may give me an idea. I suggest that you hunt through Kazal's library. She's been collecting scrolls for centuries. You ought to be able to find something useful. Meanwhile, we'll put up a sign. A sign? Cimmerian stared at Morwen for a moment, then began to smile. Road washed out, she said. Use alternative routes. Is that the kind of sign you were thinking? Exactly, Morwen said with approval. It won't stop anyone who's really determined, but it will certainly slow them down. That should give us time to come up with something better. The two women set to work at once and in short time produced a large official looking sign. Morwen offered to set it up on her way back to the enchanted forest, but Cimmerian thought it would be too awkward for her to carry while riding the broom. So once Morwen had gone, Cimmerian tucked the sign under her arm and started down the path. Cimmerian had not had a chance to do any real exploring before, though she had looked out at the mountains every day and wondered. She was happy to have an excuse to see more of the outside of her new home. It was a lovely day, warm and sunny, and at first the path was level and easy. Cimmerian was just beginning to wonder whether anyone would believe her sign once she got it put up, when the path swung left around a boulder and narrowed to a tiny ledge that sloped steeply upward. Cimmerine stopped. Now she knew why none of the knights had ridden up to the cave. The ledge was barely wide enough for a person on foot to edge along sideways. The best rider in the world couldn't have gotten a horse down it. Cimmerine rolled her sign up into a firm tight cylinder and stuck it through her belt so that she would have her hands free while she climbed. Then she stepped out onto the ledge. Sidling up the slope took a long time, for Cimmerian was careful to make sure that each part of the ledge would hold before she trusted her weight to it. She was also careful not to look down. Heights had never bothered her before, but there was a big difference between standing solidly on top of a tower in Linderwall Castle behind a four-foot parapet and inching along the, a ledge barely six inches wide with nothing between her and a long fall. She had almost reached the top of the slope where the path widened again when a portion of the ledge disappeared just ahead of her. Cimmerine pulled her foot back and tried to figure out what had happened. She hadn't seen or heard the rock crumble and fall away. There was simply a two foot gap in the ledge that hadn't been there before. She studied it for a moment, trying to think of a way of getting past. Nothing occurred to her. She felt a twinge of annoyance at the thought of all her wasted efforts, but cheered up at once when she realized that this would solve the problem of the visiting knights. If she couldn't get around or over the gap, an armored knight wouldn't be able to get by either. Cimmerine smiled and turned her head to creep back to safety. There was another two-foot gap in the ledge on her other side. Cimmerine frowned. Something very odd was going on, and she didn't like it. You look as if you're in some need of assistance, said a deep voice from above her. May I be of help? Cimmerine turned her head and saw a man standing four feet away on the path at the top of the ledge. He was tall and sharp-featured, and his eyes were a hard, bright black. Though he had a gray beard that reached nearly to his waist, his face did not look old. He wore loose robes made of blue and gray silk, 
and in one hand he held a staff as tall as himself made of dark polished wood. Possibly, Cimmerian answered. She was certain that the man was a wizard, though she had never met one before, and she did not want to agree to anything until she was sure of what she was agreeing to. The court philosopher had always claimed that wizards were very tricky. May I know to whom I am speaking? I am the wizard Zeminar, the man said, and you must be Kazal's new princess. I hope you're not trying to run away. It's not done, Cimmerine said, feeling particularly annoyed because for once she was not doing anything improper. Yes, I'm Cimmerine. I was going to say that it isn't wise to run away from your dragon, the wizard corrected mildly. I believe it's done all the time. I'm sorry, Cimmerine said, but she didn't try to explain. And I'm not running away. How did you know who I was? It seemed unlikely that I would find any other charming young lady walking so casually through the paths of silver ice, Zeminar answered. He smiled. As you see, it is easy to find oneself in difficulties if one is not properly prepared. Cimmerine decided she didn't like him. He reminded her of one of her father's courtiers a humorless, sneaky little man who had paid her compliments only when he was after something and who couldn't resist giving advice when, even when nobody wanted it. The ledge was all here when I started, she said. An idea crossed her mind and she looked hard at Seminar. I don't suppose you know what happened to the two missing bits. A flash of startled annoyance crossed the wizard's face then his expression smoothed back into pleasant politeness. He shrugged. The Pass of Silver Ice is a strange place. Odd things frequently occur. Not like this, Simmerine muttered. She was sure now that the, vi that the wizard had made the ledge vanish so that he would pretend to rescue her, but she had no idea why he would want her to think she owed him a favor. Actually, it surprised her that he had destroyed the ledge. She didn't think the dragons would be too happy when they find out. Unless he hadn't really destroyed it. What did you say? Seminar said, frowning uncertainly. Cimmerine ignored him. Without looking down, she slid her right foot, foot along the ledge. The rock felt firm and solid. Slowly, she transferred her weight and brought her left foot up beside her right. She shifted again still careful not to look down, and slid her right foot forward once again. What are you doing? Seminar demanded. Getting off this ledge, Simrine replied. I should think that was obvious. One more step would bring her to the path, but Seminar was squarely in her way. Would you mind moving back a little so I'll have somewhere to stand? Seminar's eyes narrowed, but he backed up several paces, and Simrine stepped onto the path. She wanted to heave a sigh of relief, but she did not. She wasn't going to let Zeminar have the satisfaction of knowing that she had been worried. Instead, she gave him her best royal smile and said with polite insincerity, thank you for offering help, but as you see, it wasn't needed. Do stop by sometime and visit. I will. Zeminar said it as if he meant it. And a very good day to you, Princess Simmerine. With that, he vanished. There was no smoke, or fire, or whirlwind. There wasn't even a shimmer in the air as he disappeared. He simply and suddenly was gone. Cimmerine stared at the place where the wizard had been and felt a shiver run down her spine. It took a very powerful wizard indeed to vanish so quietly, and she still didn't know what he wanted. She shook herself and started down the path. She would worry about the wizard later. Right now, she had to find a place to put up her sign so she could get back to the cave. She didn't feel very much like exploring anymore. She hadn't taken more than two or three steps when a dark shadow passed over her. Looking up, startled, she saw a flash of yellow-green scales. An instant later, a dragon landed on the path in front of her, blocking the way completely. 
His tail hung over the ledge, and he had to keep his wings partly unfurled in order to stay in balance. Cimmerian recognized him at once. It was the yellow-green dragon who had wanted to eat her the day she had arrived so unexpectedly in the dragon's cave. I saw the whole thing, the dragon said with nasty, triumphant glee, running away and talking to a wizard. Oh, just wait until Kazal heals. Here's, she'll be sorry she didn't just let us eat you and be done with it. I offer you greetings and good fortune on your travels, Cimmerine said figuring it was best to be polite to anyone as large and toothy as a dragon, even if he wasn't being at all polite to her. I'm not running away. Then what are you doing? Kazal doesn't have any business that would bring you down this side of the pass. I came out to put up a sign to keep the knights away, Simarine said. That's ridiculous, the dragon sniffed. I've been on patrol in this part of the mountains for the past week, and I haven't seen or smelled even a hint of a knight. You haven't been by Kazal's cave then, Simrine said. At, at least nine of them have shown up there in the past week, though for the past couple of days, it's mostly been a prince. Princes don't smell any different from knights, and I'd have noticed if any of them were hanging around, the dragon said flatly. And what about the wizard you were talking to? Charge! shouted a familiar voice from the other side of the dragon. Theron Dill, Simmerine shouted, I told you to go away. The green dragon twisted his long neck and glanced back over his shoulder. He seemed to bunch together like a cat crouching. Then he sprang straight up in the air and Simmerine was blinded by the cloud of dust raised by the flapping of his enormous wings. She had the presence of mind to flatten herself back against the rocks by the side of the path. And a moment later, she heard someone blundering by. She stuck out a foot. Ow, she said as Therondale fell over her with a clatter. She'd forgotten that he'd be wearing iron boots along with the rest of his armor. Simmerine, is that you? Therondale said. Of course it's me, Simmerine replied, rubbing her ankle. Open your eyes, the dust has settled. She looked up as she spoke and saw the dragon soar out of sight behind a cliff. I'm sorry, Therondil said, and then, and then in an anxious tone, he added, I hope I didn't hurt you stumbling into you like that. Simmerine started to say that it was nothing and that it had been her fault anyway, when she suddenly got a much better idea. Oh, I think you've sprained my ankle, she declared. Oh, no, Therondil said. He sounded truly dismayed though Simmerine couldn't see his face because he was wearing the hel his helmet with the visor down. I probably won't be able to walk for at least a month, she declared, and there's certainly no way I can climb down this mountain. But if you can't walk, Therondil said and paused. Then he squared his shoulders and went on. Then I suppose I'll have to carry you. He didn't sound as though he liked the idea. I don't think that would work very well, Simmerine said quickly. How will you fight when all the dragons come back if you're carrying me? No, you'll have to leave me here and go back home. You can't stay here, Therondil protested, though Simmerine's talk of when all the dragons came back had plainly made him nervous. I have to, Simmerine said, trying to sound noble and long-suffering. The dragons will make sure I get back safely to Kazal's cave, and a month isn't too long to wait after all. I don't understand, Therondil said, and he did look thoroughly puzzled. There's no point in you or anyone else coming up here to rescue me for at least a month. Not until my ankle's better, Simmerine explained politely. Oh, I see, Therondil said. He tilted his head back and scanned the empty sky. You're quite sure you'll be all right? Then I'll just be going before those dragons return. He turned and started down the path as quickly as he could manage in full armor. End of chapter three.